way to start a day, eh? Hey? Biblical to talk to yourself, you know that? Very biblical, that song that we just sung. Speak to your soul, to your soul, get up and praise the Lord. You know, we don't, you know David said that twice in the, in the space of a chapter. He asked himself, he steps out of himself, he looked at himself, he said, Why do you cast down on my soul? He said, Hope thou in God. We've got to do that from time to time. And there's some beautiful songs that have been written over the years in that theme. You know. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Right? And uh, so it's not a bad thing so every now and then, almost pretty regularly actually, when life begins to well up and it's like that wave that's rising up above us, you know, it's just hanging over our heads. And you've been in the water, haven't you? And that, that, that swell is just rising up and you know it's going to crash down soon. And it's, that's when we step out of ourselves and we, and we look at ourselves and we say, bless the Lord. Hope in God. He's your strength. He's your everything. You are my strength. You are my everything. And those waves dissipate in the presence of His glory and grace and power of his commitment, commitment to you and I, they dissipate me. God is faithful, isn't he? He's wonderful. So I love him. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, team. That was, that was amazing. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we are ending out, coming to the end of our time in Ephesians, so if you want to turn there now. Um, I want to ask, uh, I, I, I threatened to do this a couple of weeks ago, uh, Charlotte and Connor, <laughs> hiding in the corner of there. Come on, you've got to stand for me. I'm only going to do this once, maybe twice in your entire life. I've done it once before. This is it. Look at that beautiful couple. Uh, Aren't they a beautiful couple? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're not a couple, there's three of them right there. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, end of June. End of June. So, uh, what does that give us? What does that give us? <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. What does that give us? Four months. Three months. Three months. Four months. Three months. Four 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 months. That he is imparting to them, to them, not to them, but to, to, to life itself. And God, the giver of life, brings life to, to, to bless life. That's what we're all here for, right? To be a blessing. And, um, and we pray that your child will be a blessing to you and to your family and beyond that to the world around us. We know that's the truth, don't we? You know, that, that God is working in us. Good works that he beforehand foreordained that, that we should walk in them. And it's exactly the same for your child. There's a path, there's a plan. It's a great thing to do. Please sit down, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and grandparents, right behind them. Look at that. Right behind the grandparents. <laughs> um, let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness to us. And we do. We thank you for Charlotte and Connor. We thank you for the child. We pray, Father God, that your nurturing hand, your maturing hand, your strengthening hand, Lord, would be upon that child and you would keep him or her safe and bring him into this world, Lord God, for the blessing that you purpose that he or she would be. Thank you for the richness of life and the comfort that we have in knowing that all life is in your hands. You are the giver of life. You are the sustainer of life. You are the blesser of life.
life. We pray as you have given, you will sustain, you will bless this life for your praise and your glory for the furtherance of your kingdom. And as we always pray at this time, Lord, we look ahead to that day when this child will lift their head, heavenly, that day that Steve spoke about, that day when you save, that day when you redeem, that day when you call someone unto yourself, Lord God. We pray for that day, for this child's salvation in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. Amen. Vision 6. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not absolutely blank. Jess. Yes. Oh. I've forgotten the name. Uh, Kalani Audrey. Kalani Audrey. It's so three, two, how many weeks ago? Um, last Friday. Last Friday. So there's another grandmother right there and a great grandmother right next to her. <laughs> Jess um, gave birth to Kalani Audrey. That's a beautiful name. Yeah. So I know Jess is not here. Please tell her we're praying for her. Please tell her that uh, we're very mindful that her life, the whole universe has been turned upside down. <laughs> and so is yours. Yeah. Uh, she's loving it. They're both loving it. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Ephesians. I haven't forgotten that. Um, let's open our Bibles to the sixth chapter of Ephesians. We are, again, as I said, approaching the end of this epistle. Can I ask you to pray with me one more time? Father in heaven, we, we thank you that you are the lover of our soul. And that no one loves you more, loves us more than you love us, Lord And uh, we're so grateful. We're just overwhelmed every day. Even as we sung today, you're the one that made us your child. And um, you've done it for all of us at different times and different paths. And we just want to pray for Jim right now. Lord, that in his time, his path, Lord God, he would find you as his saviour. Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father, that you love this man more than he can know or understand. Pray you to remove the scales from his eyes, the hurts and the pain. Lord, you can lift them that he might see the comfort, the solace, the compassion and the mercy that you have for him. That you would save him, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. Um, finally, my brethren, let me read these verses to you. We've read them many times. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in, this, in, sorry, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which is able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. All the fiery darts. And to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's where we finished last week. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all of the saints. So in this final chapter, the Apostle Paul is using a 
being slain up week after week, the analogy of an armour-clad soldier. Um, and he has identified what is essential through that analogy, what is essential for you and I as children of God to live Christian lives in this world. A world that at its best may tolerate us and at its worst despises and would destroy us. You know that's true, don't you? We are in a spiritual battle, Paul has been reminding us. Verse 12, we're going to read it again. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And our weapons, our weapons that we have been discovering or have been reading and looking at are to continue, or for us to continue, I'd say, I should say, in our ongoing campaign against this enemy of our soul. And it's not physical, is it? Nothing that Paul has been talking about is physical. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, a verse we've constantly gone to. He says, for the weapons of our warfare, you know this verse, right? We know it now, don't we? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into the captivity and to the obedience of Christ. So we're engaged in a spiritual conflict, wielding spiritual weapons. And what we have come to realize is those weapons are in reality, or I should say the reality of those weapons, I'm trying to use my word reality here in my sentence, it's not working. In reality, they are Jesus Christ. That's the reality of these weapons. They are Jesus Christ active within our lives is what they are. Um, and what they are is us putting on, we have this term, putting on Jesus Christ. Because he is our truth, isn't he? The belt of truth that everything is held together by. He is our truth. He is our righteousness. He is our breastplate. The righteousness of God through Christ Jesus that protects our heart. The enemy wants to, wants to drag us down and constantly condemn us. And, but again, Romans chapter 8 says that it's not Christ who condemns us. No. No, no, no. He is our protection. He is our breastplate of righteousness, right? And He is our peace. We are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the very foundation that we stand upon. The thing that digs our feet is the reality is that Christ is the one who holds us and secures us in this world, in this life. He is our peace. Nothing can steal our peace from us because Christ himself is our peace and he is the very source of our faith as Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 tells us that I have been crucified. This is the Apostle Paul. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. Do you say this with him? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live now in the flesh, in this world, in this life, I live by faith in the Son of God who has loved me and given himself for me. And he's our shield. He's the one that stands between us and the fiery darts of the enemy. He's taken it all upon himself. When he was raised up on that cross, he took the consequences of all our sin. He took it all upon himself. He is our shield. He is our sure hope of salvation. The helmet of salvation that protects our mind. Because the enemy wants to come along and just say to you over and over again, who do you think you are? You're no son of God. You're no child of God. We sing that song. I'm a son of God. And the enemy wants to get in there and say, no. Look at you. Look at the life you've lived. Look at the week you've had. Look at it. You're no, 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 no. We are sons of God. It is his righteousness. His righteousness. That is a gift to us or imputed to us through the work of Jesus Christ. And he is the living word. In the 
beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is the living Word. We speak His Word. His Word is our sword. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to get right down and divide between that which is soulish and that which is spiritual. You know, we can be confused and the enemy wants to get us confused and wants to get us off track and get us all, all worried about those soulish things in this world, the things of our imaginations, the things of our own desires and plans. And, and you know, if he wants us distracted by those things. No, the Word of God brings us back on track, that which is spiritual and it speaks to us and it shows us how we live this Christian life. The Word of God is our sword. We can dice the enemy, can't we, with that thing? So again, the armour of God is putting on the reality of who Jesus Christ is and what He has accomplished on our behalf for us. Romans chapter 13 says in verse 12, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. We know that's true. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk proper, sorry, properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness or in lust, not in strife, not in envy, but what? Let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And in so doing, we make no provision for the, to, for the flesh to fulfil its lust in our lives. Jesus Christ is our armour. He is the source of our strength and our ongoing victory. And if that is so, you believe that? Yes. And we need to be connected to Him. We need to be connected to Him. Remember, this is armour for warfare. Who ever heard of an army fighting a war, an army in that war that is disconnected from its command centre. Who ever heard of that? And how long would that army last if it was disconnected from its command centre? How long would it last? With no intel coming in, no, no, fr no, no fresh supplies coming in, no resources available to it. How long would it last? Not long at all, right? We need to be connected to Jesus Christ in the most intimate of fashions. We need to be. And so the Apostle Paul, having described the armour of God, now says in verse 18, let's read it again, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all of the saints. Look, we've been provided weaponry that has no equal in the spiritual fight. That's why we are guaranteed the victory. Because of the weaponry that has been provided for us. But there is a true sense that unless we are intimately connected to Christ in prayer, then our weaponry may as well be nothing more than plastic toys. You've seen the movies, haven't you? You know, they're clad in their armour and they're running around like they're free as a bird fighting. Because it's plastic, right? It's plastic. Look, I'm, 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 I'm distracting myself here. Let me give you another, a better analogy. This is what I mean by this. I've always, and maybe it's because I'm a selfish little brat, you know, but I've always been completely disappointed with toy weapons, right, that are based upon the heroes from our action movies. From our, I'm always disappointed with it, right? Because you see the hero on the screen, Right? And the hero, whoever he may be, is vanquishing all of the villains. There's never any doubt in your mind that at the end of the movie, once the credits start rolling, that your hero is standing alive and well and victorious and the enemy is defeated on the ground. Why? Because of the weapons, the power that he has, right? She has. That's why, right? And so what do you do? You go to the shop to buy your child your grandchildren, to buy them the toy that every kid just has to have. It's the hero with his weapon. 
It's beautifully dressed up in a box. It's got all of the all of the wham bam power, all of the stuff pictured there. It's all there, right? And so you buy it and you get it home. And what do you do? You get it home. You pull it out of its packet. You watch your child, your grandchild. You look at them. Their eyes are lit up with excitement and anticipation. This is me talking, right? <laughs> They're probably going to love it. Remember, I'm a selfish brat here, right? What is it? I look at it every single time. It's nothing but a plastic replica with a spring that squirts out a little plastic dart that goes <laughs> maybe 10 centimetres, right? And it's got these sound effects, these tinny little sound effects that sound like they're coming from a 1970s AM radio. Most of you don't know what that sounds like, but it's dreadful. Right? This, this is what I mean. Without prayer, that is all the armour of God will ever be to us. Without prayer, that's all it's ever going to be. If we're not connected to the very source of the power, if we're not connected to the one who gives that power to our lives, the one who, in a sense, actually activates the armour of God in our lives. Without prayer, we are on the battlefield with our plastic toys by ourselves, right? And we come to church and we listen to a series on the armor of God. Without prayer, you know, it's just nothing more than that. An interesting Bible study that may well excite our emotions, may well fire us up in the morning. Without prayer, the reality of the genuine power of God active within our lives, it won't be, it won't be there. It might move us to make a few, to, you know, surface changes within our lives. You know, it might cause us to curtail some of the things that we know that God doesn't want going on in our lives. It might do that. But without prayer, within a very short time, without being connected to our Heavenly Father through Christ in prayer, the enemy lures us back into those sinful habits. Without prayer. Without prayer, our armour is nothing more than a plastic copy incapable of stopping the enemy's attacks. Prayerless Christians, prayerless Christians, and this is not a personal attack on anybody, but prayerless Christians are feeble and weak and impoverished. Prayerless Christians don't realise the danger that they are in. We have to realize that as we pray, we are taking up a great weapon. And in that sense, prayer really is the weapon of weapons. It really is. Prayer is the activating power to God's armor, as I have said. Prayer is the very source. Jesus describing um, the intimate connected life said this in John chapter 15. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, notice what he says, you will ask, what is that? You will pray what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you may bear much fruit so that you will be my disciple. In this passage that we call the parable of the vine, Jesus was preparing his disciples for the battle that was coming to their lives. Uh, he was stressing to them that the only safe place for the believer in this world is an intimate communion with him and the Father. He's stressing that in that, in that, in that, um, in that teaching, right? And from, and, and from that place of, of communion, they would bear much fruit, lasting fruit. It would remain, he says there, a victorious, fruitful Christian life. And here the Apostle Paul is saying the same thing. It is vital in our warfare that it is fought from a place of intimate connectedness to Christ in prayer. So Lord... Lord, strengthen me. Help me in my inner integrity. 
That's the belt of truth. That's truth that holds me together. Help me to live righteously. Lord, I can't do it without you. That's my breastplate again of righteousness. Help me to grow in faith. Help me to trust you in all things. There's my shield held up in all things, Lord, every single day. Right? God, help me to stand in this salvation, this wonderful salvation, that, that I might live it without doubt or fear. Lord, that I might know that I am yours and you are mine and nothing can separate us. Lord, help me in this wonderful salvation. It's my helmet. Helmet of salvation. And Lord... May your word define me. May your precious word define who I am as I take this gospel message to this world as a sword. Let's put on Jesus Christ. Let's live in victory. Let's seek him all the more. But please note something, that prayer is not just coming to God with a list of Stuff, isn't it? We need stuff. That's all right. It's not just that. Prayer is being with Him. You know that? It's being with Him. Yes, it's speaking. Of course it is. Yes, it's communion. Yes, it's conversation with our Heavenly Father. But it's also just being in His presence and appreciating Him, appreciating Him for who He is. You know, it's waiting. It's being silent. It's, it's, it's listening. It's praise. It's thanksgiving. It's meditating upon the goodness of who He is in my life. It's relationship. See, that's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18. In the first verse, He said, Men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Why does not lose heart? Always pray and not lose heart. Why? Because God will take care of His own. We're safe in that relationship with Him. Right? Prayer is developing a consistent, intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father. It's not now we turn to God in time of difficulty. Well, it is. But if that's all it is, we're in trouble. Again, I've used this analogy many times. Uh, on the deck of the Titanic, as that ship was going down, survivors reported that they heard a conversation between Captain Smith and those that had surveyed the damage that was done by the iceberg that had hit them. It made it into the movie, by the way, this conversation that survivors reported. And they heard him say this, simply this, how bad is it? How bad is it? To be answered with the devastating reply, and that's how it's portrayed, there's nothing left to do but pray. Which he then responded, oh, it's come to that. It's come to that. When everything else has failed, all that we can do has failed, now we pray. And that so often becomes a person's practice. It's then that they become earnest. It's then that they become consistent in their prayer. It's then that they are crying out to God daily in tears on their face. It's then that they are seeking His presence in their situation. It's then these things take place. And I know God hears that prayer. Don't misunderstand me. He hears that prayer. And in truth, it is treating God like an insurance policy, is it not? Yes, I believe in God. That went up, didn't it? Yes, I believe in God. Of course I believe in God. I know He will be there for me. Huh? I know He will be there for me. Where is there? There is somewhere in the future when I need Him. He will be there for me. Well, if that's become the consistency of our prayer or our communion with God, then let me ask you this question without judgment of anyone, right? What are the hardest of relationships to deal with? I'm going to answer for you. The hardest of relationships for us to deal with are those that only show up when they want something. 
when they have a need. Look, you love them, right? You love them and you are so glad that they know that they can come to you and that you will be always there for them. You love them like that. But what you desire is a relationship of presence with them. And it's no different to God. He wants us to know and to live in the knowledge that He is always present with us and we with Him. Paul said in our verses here in verse 18, praying always. Meaning prayer has become the very way of a life for you and I. I mean, of course we can't mentally be praying 24-7, can we? No, that's impossible. But what we can live, do is live in the constant reality of God's presence within our life. But again, it's not that he's following, please hear this, it's not like he's following us around like our superhero on a leash who's ready to jump in in times of danger. No, no, no. We live in a consciousness of his presence and the truth of that permeates every facet of my life. He's always with me. I'm never alone. I'm never abandoned. I'm never defenseless. Never, right? See, this is what Satan wants. He wants you disconnected from God. I've said this many times. He can't do anything about your salvation. You're the Lord's child. But he wants you disconnected from God. He wants you to try. He wants you trying to sort things out without God. He wants you anxious about the things that you have no control over. He wants you worrying and fearful about your own capabilities. Can I deal with this? I don't know how I'm going to get through this day. I've got no idea. That's how he wants you. He wants you well and truly alone in an unsure world. Be reminded that the cross of Christ has won us a forever access to the throne of Christ. A forever. Jesus has made us a way for us into the Father's presence and we don't ever, ever have to leave it. Peter had a taste of this on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know the story? He went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with, with Christ, Peter, James and John, they were there, they all fell asleep, their eyes, they open up, their eyes are open to what's in front of them, there is the glorified Christ. So the veil of his the veil of his, his humanity is rolled back, and in some way God was revealing to them, not in its fullness because no man can survive that, but in some way God was revealing to them who Christ really was, the glory of his pre-existent being was being um, was being revealed before their very presence, and there was a couple of other guys there as well. Moses and Elijah. Gives me, I don't have time to talk about that, but um, I have some strong thoughts about that. <laughs> Another day. What was Peter's response? Lord, let us build three tabernacles one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. What was he saying? Let us never leave this place. Why do we want to go back down there where all those humans are? Because wherever humans are, problems are, right? I just want to stay here in your presence. That's what God has done for us. He's made a way for us to exist, to live eternally. Eternity starts now, brothers and sisters. In the presence of our God and Savior. That's who we are. Dwellers in the presence of the Most High God. When we live there, and we relate to God there, you know what our prayer becomes? That's the prayer that defeats the enemy. He can threaten us with all fear and doubt and all the anxiety that he likes, but we know that we will never be alone. We know that. We know that there is nothing that he can do to separate us from the loving presence of God who has given us the victory. We know that, right? So we are praying 
he says in verse 18, always, with all prayer and supplication, all prayer, literally all kinds of prayer, right? There's praise, there's thanksgiving. Let me read this to you, 1 Timothy chapter 2, says in verse 1, Therefore, excuse me, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Psalm 100, 100 verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name. Psalm 118 verse 29, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for he is, his mercy endures forever. So praise and thanksgiving is prayer, people. It's prayer. All kinds of prayer. It's prayer. And intercession is simply praying on behalf of others where supplication is that list that we talked about. Supplication is earnestly, specifically asking for something from God. Prayer, always. All prayer, supplication. What did it say? In the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit, I, I think, can be best understood by considering its alternative. And its alternative is praying in the flesh, right? Which is praying in my will. You know? It's praying according to my own desires. It's praying according to my emotions. Oh my goodness, you do not want to pray from that, from that, from that foundation. From my emotions, from my, from my insights. Well, that's even worse, right? <laughs> But praying in the Spirit is communicating to the very heart of God. It's when, it's when God's, God's will and God's desire begin to take centre stage for my life. God's will and God's desire begin to take centre stage for my life. Now Romans chapter 8 tells us in verse 26 and verse 27 that he helps us in our weakness, right? And it's speaking about as we are seeking his help in prayer, no, we know something. As we seek his help in prayer, we know that he prays both, this is the Holy Spirit, he prays both for us and with us, and it's according to the will of God. So there is a supernatural thing happening as the Holy Spirit settles things in our hearts. Have you ever experienced that? He settles things in our hearts. He leads us. He gives us direction in prayer. And we pray for them with a conviction, knowing that they are God's will. Praying in the Spirit is God-inspired. It's God-directed. It's God-glorified. Look, we still have our list of things. We still have our list of things. And we still bring them to God every day. Who's got a list? You might write it down, you might have it in your head, but there are a million things, aren't there? There's a million things, there's a thousand people, there's a trillion circumstances. You've told too many people, I'll pray for you, and you've forgotten. We've got a list, right? And that's fine. We've got a list that is fine. But if we let the list dominate our, our, our communion with God, we can find ourselves in a very, very mechanical, mechanical, best way I can describe it, dry relationship. What we are being encouraged to do is to be open to what the Spirit is doing. Whenever we wait upon the Lord, that's why stillness, that's why silence, that's why, Lord, what do you want me to pray? And making space, what do you have me to pray for? Right? So praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Being watchful, being watchful. Well, being spiritually alert. Being sober and spiritually alert. It literally means to stay awake, right? 
Am I talking about staying awake at a prayer meeting? Well, no, but yes, that's a good thing to do. Uh, nothing more embarrassing than going to, to a prayer meeting and being the snorer. Um, hands up. There's no snores in the road. No. This is what it is being watchful. Satan is invading in every aspect of life in society. You believe that, don't you? And we need to be watching and we need to be praying. We need to be standing in the gap for our children, our grandchildren, for our friends, our neighbours, those we work with, praying for all of those that are being swept up into this godless culture. I hear a lot of people saying, oh, hey, what? this is what the world is. This is what the world is. It's watching and complaining. You, you get that? You see that? This is happening and complaining. The world is turning to this and complaining. Watching and complaining. What are we called to do? We're called to be watching and praying. Very different, right? Watching and praying. We must keep our spiritual eyes open. I need also to keep my eyes open to the dangers of temptation. I mean, Jesus said to his disciples in Gethsemane, remember, watch and pray, mm -hmm. that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, and the flesh is weak. Mark chapter 14. See, when you see the danger, this is part of watching, of course. When you see the danger of temptation lurking, um, it's time to pray preemptively. Do you like that idea? When you see it lurking, it's time to pray preemptively against it. And what I'm saying is don't wait. Don't entertain. Don't try and ascertain whether or not you can handle it. No, 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 no. Ours is to be watching and praying that the enemy doesn't get an advantage over us in our life. We don't sit there watching and waiting. We know, don't we? We know what temptation looks like. We know what we shouldn't be involved in. And we also know the lure of it. That's why it's called temptation. What about that? It's tempting to our old nature. So as soon as it rises up, that's, that's when we pray. That's when we bring the sword of the Spirit out. And you dice it. Being watchful to this end with all preparation and supplication for all the saints. Look, the truth is, prayer is not easy. I've got to say that. It's not an easy thing. It is warfare. It really is. Prayer requires faith. Prayer takes us pushing through a lot of stuff in life, right? It really does. Pushing through a lot of lazy attitudes and, and constant distractions within our life. Oh, I've got time for that. Time for everything else, but not for that. Problems never cease, do they? They never cease. Trials are always coming and the enemy is always there. But we don't give up praying. We never give up praying. Some say, and I don't disagree with this. I don't disagree with this. The Lord may tell you to stop praying for something. And only you will know that. It's between you and Him. But the overall exhortation that we're given when it comes to prayer is that we never stop praying. We never stop praying. And do you know why we never stop praying? Pretty simple. Because you don't know just how close to the answer you really are. That's the thing, isn't it? Prayer that defeats the devil is prayer that just keeps on going. It's prayer that knows that the enemy is defeated. How often have people become discouraged and quit praying at that pivotal moment? Pivotal moment. Prayer is warfare and we never concede. We never can see, especially when we're talking about praying for the unsaved. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, verse we know so well. Verse 4, the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, 
lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in on them. Pray and keep praying that their eyes will be open to see the glory of the gospel of Christ, his salvation. Don't give up on them, even if they curse you, even if they attack you for your faith. Remember, they can't see what you can see. Remember, they're blind to it. And they're behaving like blind people. You need to behave like someone who sees, someone who knows. They need us to keep going that they might become someone who sees. Remember this, Satan has no right whatsoever to hold them against their will as he does. Yes, he does. Anyone that can see Jesus will accept him, right? If you can see Christ, you will accept him. You will choose him. He died for them. He paid a price for them. That's what we often say. I don't understand why anyone would reject the gospel. God promises to forgive us of all our sin, to accept, accept us as his child, to provide all our needs according to his riches and glory, to never leave us nor forsake us, to walk with us all the way through this life and beyond that, welcome us into glory. For what? Believe. And we go, why would anybody reject that? Because they don't have the eyes to see. They've been blinded. They are blinded. And we don't give up on the blind. We keep on praying and we keep on praying and we keep on praying because you know what? Satan has no right to them. I know I've said them, he has no right to them, he has no claim to them. And so you've got to claim them for the kingdom of God. That's how we live, that's how we pray. The kingdom of God. And you also got to know something else. Satan doesn't want to fight you. You know that? He doesn't want to fight you. Because he knows he cannot win. He cannot win if you fight back. He knows that. He is a defeated foe. Remember what I told you on day one. The only power that Satan has in your life is the power of the light if you believe it. Believe the truth of what Jesus says, not what the lie of what the enemy says. Satan doesn't want to fight you. Because he knows if you fight back, he cannot win. He's a defeated foe. And because he has no right again to hold those that he does, therefore he must, he must release them. And so Satan's only hope is if you don't pray. That's his only ground. His only hope is if you give up praying. He knows that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. They are mighty. And that word strongholds is literally an image of a, of a, of a strong stone monolith building castle. He hasn't got anywhere to hide. He's got nowhere to hide. He don't want to fight us. So keep praying. Persistent prayer defeats the enemy. Pray always. Pray all kinds of prayer. Pray in the spirit. Pray watchfully. Pray patiently. Around that. Around that. Our armor is truth. I'm done by the way. Our armor is truth, righteousness, peace. Faith, the word of God, and the weapon of weapons is how glorious it is that we can come into the presence of our Father. Let me read these final words as the elements are brought your way. Um, our tradition here at Calvary, if you're a visitor this morning, is to sit under the word of God, allow God to minister to our hearts, and then gather around the communion table. In the, in, the, in the desire that God, having ministered to us as his sons and daughters, we can refresh ourselves in this time. We can search our hearts as these elements come your way. This is what I'm asking you to do. 
is to search your heart right now. Thank you. And if there be anything in you that, that God is not happy with and you know it, just, just remember, you're with Him. He's with you. You're in, you're in His presence. And just, just know that He is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins. He's faithful and just. So just, Lord, help me. Help me right now. The wonder of who you are and the wonder of what you have done, the power of the work within my life. Lord, I look back and I see the glory of who you are and what you've done. You've changed me. You've transformed me. I look at myself now and I see myself in the light of the person that I was and all I can say is thank you, Lord. Praise you for what you've done. But I know you haven't finished, Father. I know there's so much more for you yet to do. So, Lord, shine the light of your conviction upon me, your child, right now this morning. Lord, I, I need your forgiveness. I need, Lord, your washing. I need your cleansing. I need your empowering. I need everything that you have for me, that I might be all that you want me to be for others in this world. Lord God, forgive me. Forgive me. That's the prayer that we approach the communion table. He said to the disciples, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. We're doing this today. Remembering him. Who he is. He is our God. He's our Savior. He's our deliverer. He's our victim. I'm going to read the rest of these verses to the end of the chapter. I'm going to, then we'll pray. Father, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, Paul says, that utterances may be given to me. Pray for me, he says. You know, he was writing this epistle from prison. And it amazes me. Notice what his request is. And for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He doesn't say pray for me that I'll be delivered from this, from my chains, from my situation and my circumstance. He doesn't say get me out of here. He says Lord, Pray that the Lord would give me utterance, give me the words to say, the things to say in the situation that I'm in right now. What a wonderful prayer that is. <laughs> that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. I represent the gospel right here in my chains, right now, all the same. That it is that in it I may speak boldly, that my chains, that where God has brought me, this circumstance, as hard as it is, there might be boldness through this experience to speak as I ought to speak. But that you may know that my chains and how I am doing you. <sighs> yeah, yes, that guy. <laughs> Tai Chi. That guy, he's mentioned five times. He's a very close friend of Paul's. That you may know how I'm doing, I'm sending my proud beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord to make all things known to you. He's coming to tell you how I'm doing. But just pray right now that the Lord uses me. Whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs, and that he may comfort your heart. Peace to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Uh, you got your, you got the elements? Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, our eyes have been opened. And that we hold these elements in our hands because we see. We see things that are indeed beyond our, our, our fullness of understanding. 
fullness of comprehension beyond truly being able to embrace the depth, the height, the width of your love through the cross. I pray, Lord, that you would continue, as you have told us even in this epistle, that these things are being revealed to us. As we seek you, may we know each day of our lives this love that was willing to sacrifice all, that's willing to lay down his life that we might take up life. Lord, we thank you for this cup that represents blood that was shed, pure, holy blood that was shed and washes us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness that makes us holy in your sight. Bring us, Lord, daily into a deeper understanding and appreciation of that. You called us to be holy even as you are holy. This bread that represents a body that was lifted up, the very bread of life, and by partaking, we experience life eternal. Lord, I don't understand it. But I know there was one, your son, whose life was given for me. And it has changed my life. We're here today to confess that, Lord. You've done so much. And I know there is so much more to be done in us and through us. But you've done it all. Lord, we rejoice in the final words from the cross to tell us tonight, it is finished, work is done. We want to know you, Lord. We want to know what the fellowship of suffering is all about. We want to know the power of resurrection, Lord. So I ask you, Lord, to forgive us of our sin. Cleanse us of unrighteousness. Draw us nearer that we might grow and we might know and we might understand what this next step is really all about. In Jesus' name we thank you. Let's take the bread together. And this cup. Thank you, God. Thank you.